They follow the traditions of men. A few weeks ago, a much older woman came near to where I was standing, and I overheard her lamenting about how modern influences crowd out the old ways. She shook her head as the refrain went on, they keep forsaking the good traditions. So what was the cause of her grief? A reasonable answer might be, well, the aftermath of Vatican II. But no, that wasn't the case. It was the management of the American Indio Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Here I was standing in the gift shop, and she came in speaking actually a Native American language, which was very interesting to have this happen. And I felt myself privileged to have a, a real Native American speaking woman come into this gift shop. And, but when she spoke in English, the tone of her voice, from the way she lamented what was lost, she sounded exactly like an old Catholic upset about the new ways watering things down. <laughs> so why am I sharing this? The traditions of the elders and new ways that cuts across cultures. And many of us certainly can sympathize with that Native American woman, because we've seen the traditions that we respect get discarded in our own church context. Now, we aren't so concerned with that older woman's Pueblo traditions, are we? But that raises the question. So what traditions are worth fighting for? Are traditions good just because they're old? In our gospel reading, we heard Jesus as he spoke about many traditions that are not worth bringing forward. Those are what he calls the traditions of men. What is Jesus getting at here? Is Jesus distinguishing between biblical traditions on one hand and non-biblical traditions on the other? Well, we see that he wasn't against all tradition that wasn't mandated by Scripture. Just think of the synagogue, which actually doesn't have a clear precedent in the Old Testament. That's separate from temple worship. He was willing to participate in that. But in our context, we can also look at this and say, well, wait a minute. Isn't our situation a little bit different? Because we have the Holy Spirit, and don't we believe that the Holy Spirit works through the church to give us some of our traditions? And so the question perhaps becomes a little bit more nuanced. But the question still remains. Are all these traditions helpful to you? And how much of this rejection of Jesus' traditions applies to you? In what way might it apply to you and me? Well, let's consider that perhaps it isn't the traditions themselves, but the way in which we approach them. The problem that Jesus is isolating is tradition without the heart. Think of what Samuel said to Jesse in the Old Testament. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Picking up on this, St. Paul says that he is making a point so that they might be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance, but not what is in the heart. So that's the focus of Paul, to get us emphasizing the heart. But certainly he wasn't against tradition either. So let's consider this by looking at the outside and then the inside. And then what you'll soon understand is bringing the inside to the outside. First, the outside. Uh, the outward appearance. In this case, yes, the Pharisees were focusing on mere externals. Uh, Jesus refers to how they are washing the, uh, so emphasizing washing the outwards of pots and, and cups and, and making sure that they're eating the right foods. And why are you not following our traditions? Now, these may not be bad traditions in and of themselves, but the problem is, is that they became 
ends in themselves. The idea was that those who do these things just right, they're the ones who become righteous. They focused on these exter externals from the elders because that's what was valued in their society, the elders, that they were a religious culture. But things don't have to be old to cause a religious fervor for external appearances this way. Just think of what it was like in your elementary school, how at times, or, or even, or, well, especially perhaps in middle school, and some of you are going through this right now, those who wear the right clothes, who look the right way, they are part of the in-group. <laughs> and you know what? As we grow older, even though the way these patterns play out change, they still are in our hearts. We still gravitate to externals, external markers which help us to understand who I can trust and who I can't trust, in groups and out groups. We see this in the way people wear masks. Are, are you part of my group or are, are you not? And many, much of this, many of these things, if you look under it, has a religious fervor to it because underneath is a sense of, okay, I'm okay inside if I'm okay outside. Now, in our context, it's more similar to what Jesus was addressing uh, because like them, we see power in tradition as those who are people of faith. We appeal to the elders. And if you notice throughout church history, even those who are trying to seek change are also appearing to some older authority. Oh, in the earlier days it was different. It was more simple then, so that's why it should be more simple now. And on one hand, that's totally appropriate if, on, if we're looking at matters of the heart, theology and how God forms our heart and how we receive true wisdom from the elders. All right, that's about our hearts. But sometimes, and more times than we often are aware of, these external forms mask the heart, hide the heart so we don't really know what's going on inside. But yet they have the appearance of righteousness and they become merely traditions of men. This can have to do with what you wear. Are you wearing the right kind of veil to church or are you? Are, <laughs> Well, let me give you an example of real life that seems a little bit extreme. One person spoke with disdain. He's no longer Catholic because his grandmother used to tell him that if you brush your teeth before Mass, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> so no wonder he was a little put off. So, you know, so there are, you can imagine the, the, the group of people uh, who, who are, are, are the holy ones who don't brush their teeth before Mass. You know, St. Jerome, who was willing to brush his teeth before Mass, but he said that he kept the crest, however, the toothpaste in the cabinet. <laughs> so uh, we all, so this seems extreme, but the problem is, now I suppose hypothetically, all right, that, that not brushing one's teeth could prepare one's heart for the for Mass, <laughs> hypothetically, right? Um, but the problem was is this grandmother clearly didn't take that extra step of trying to form her grandson's heart. Now this can happen to us too in ways that are more subtle. Are you concerned that your family looks just right, dressed just right, coming to church? Are you concerned about whether they have the right posture um, or in other contexts? We can fill in the blanks and, and multiply examples of this. These are all good things in and of themselves. But do you can make that connection between how we act, what we do, and how it forms the heart? That's what matters. Pride, foolishness. Did you think that list would ever end? All these things come from within, and they defile a man. And this is how he ends his discourse. Oh, wait a minute. Is there more to this passage that wasn't included in our reading here? I mean, how's that for an encouraging way to end a conversation? He talked about the inside, but he only talks about bad things that come from within. <laughs> uh, so where do we go? So he's shown us two things. Your outward traditions don't make you right with God. They don't get you into the in-group with him. But nor does what is in your heart. 
So what do you do? Where do you go? Well, the answer is this. Only Jesus is in the in-group. Only Jesus is in the in-group. Only he went to the cross, received the nails, the spear, the death. Only he was raised. He is your righteousness. He is the one who can raise you up, who are sunk in sin, and show you the way forward. So if our external behavior doesn't help us, and there's only sin in the heart, then the only answer is to go to him. And that's the answer that Mark uses the rest of his gospel to teach us about. So we looked at the outside. We looked at the inside. <laughs> There's no answers there, which is why we need to take the inside out. <laughs> In other words, bring your inside to Christ so that he might transform you, so that he is inside you and you become more like him. So then the next natural question is, how? <laughs> Take any traditions that help you do just that. Ignore any traditions that don't help you do just that. And don't pay attention to what anyone else is doing. The saying is, keep your eyes on your own plate. Fasting does not make you holy. Let me be very clear about that. Fasting does not make you holy. So don't compare your fasting with others. Fasting, if done right, helps you to look inside and see that you are not holy. That's the purpose, the main purpose of fasting. And so what the result is that it makes you go to Jesus with more fervor so that he can form your heart. Food defiles no one, as Jesus says in this passage. It can't defile anyone because it is created by God. But it's true, however, that food can keep you from God if you become attached to it for pleasure or out of fear. And so in this way, it is helpful. It's a helpful tradition to put it aside so that you go to the Lord as your source of your joy and so that he is the one who frees you from your fear and your need for provision. So, yes, keep your eyes on your own plate, but on another hand, we can also say, to see how this applies in more broad ways, keep your focus on your own prayer. So sometimes that means, yes, having traditional prayers. Uh, and because those traditional prayers can help us to form our own words. But there are some people, some evangelicals, who disdain traditional prayers because they see so many people praying them in a rote way. So yes, it's true. Sometimes we need to just pray extemporaneously. But those traditional prayers are helpful if they form your heart so that you're able to pray with your own words in a powerful way. As we've said here in our parish, non nova sed nove. Those are Latin words which means not new, but with newness. A living tradition is what we're after, and that comes from transformed hearts. So before we conclude, I'd like to just give a test about whether or not you might be, without even realizing it, focusing on externals and not what's on the inside. If you are ever judgmental about others or have any contempt for others in any way or for yourself because of customs and traditions, then you are focusing on traditions of men, even if they are under the guise of traditions of God. And so what is the solution? Jesus already gave it to us. Look on the inside where you see coveting, deceit, pride, the list goes on. And then go back to Jesus. Go back to Jesus and invite others to do the same, to receive mercy so that your heart can be transformed. St. John Chrysostom said, 
if you came to church to look for holy people, you were wrong. If you came here to seek God, you made the right choice. That's all that matters. That's what our traditions are for. So are your traditions, this brings us back to our initial question, are your traditions and customs, are they the right ones? Well, we just simply respect whatever forms the heart in you or in others. Is there someone else you see who has a pure heart? Maybe his traditions aren't yours, but perhaps you need to be humble enough to take a page out of his book and not try to give him a page of yours. So I don't know the condition of the heart of that Native American Pueblo woman in that gift shop, uh, but having just been in New Mexico, I began to read Willa Cather's classic book, Death Comes for the Archbishop. And one of the themes in this book are competing traditions, these European traditions that he has brought into his missionary diocese, which comes against the traditional ways of the Native Americans. And part of what uh, Willa Cather is illustrating for us as she develops the character of the protagonist, Bishop Latour, is that he has a good sense of balance. He's not bent on imposing his traditions on others, and he's willing to allow that initial culture to stay to whatever extent it's helpful. And he's actually, uh, based on a historical character, the whole book is, uh, uh, Bishop Jean-Baptiste Lamy, and so this is a fictional, his fictional words, but based on the true character, where somebody asked about these traditions of the Indians. What do you think about these, these, these barbaric ways? And Father Latour remarked that their veneration for old customs was a quality he liked in the Indians, and that it played a great part in his own religion. Not their customs, but a similar reverence for the elder. He wanted to follow their customs, but because he admired, he respected their respect for the elders, which illustrated humility. That's the key. If traditions give you humility, then you're on the right path. If they make you proud, you're on the wrong path. So clearly, there's no dichotomy between tradition and the heart. They are not mutually exclusive. Traditions can clearly direct the heart, even though some traditions can lead people astray when they become man-centered. So what do we do today? We give all we have to receive the heart of Christ. May his spirit transform our hearts and in turn direct all that we do.